Mr. Ramp, really good to see you this morning. Uh, how's conference been for you? Well, good morning. Look, I, I think uh, it's been great to get uh, everyone back together in person. Our message is that we're building back better uh, from this awful pandemic and the government's getting on with the job, whether it's the uh, support for workers and uh, employers through the pandemic as we come out the other side, through to the reform of social care and dealing with the NHS backlog and the courts backlog, which is obviously dear to my heart given the justice brief. Indeed, and we, we will move on to that in just a second. But uh, you and I have, have spoken an awful lot, frankly, over the past year and a half. Largely, however, that has been when you were occupying a, a slightly different job, that, that of Foreign Secretary. Many people saw your move to justice as, uh, as a demotion. Was there any part of you aggrieved at the decision that the Prime Minister made? No. Um, look, uh... And my job is to serve the government and ultimately the country. The Prime Minister um, has asked me to go back to the Minister of Justice, where I've served twice before. Um, I've been given the role of Deputy Prime Minister, which I'm honoured to, to do. And frankly, what I care about most is delivering uh, on the court's backlog, given the aftermath of the appalling case of Sarah Everard, what more we can do to make women feel safer and confident in the criminal justice system uh, and rehabilitating offenders more generally. So uh, to be honest with you, all of the media, if you like, side uh, show, I, I just um, I tend to cut through and just get on with the job. And it is a pretty tremendous job that you have in front of you, one, one has to say, uh, tackling the problems with the courts, tackling the problems with the prisons. I, I just want to pick up on something, though, that we heard from both uh, Kit Malthouse, the policing minister, and, in, and indeed the prime minister yesterday, a degree of pushback on the idea that the significant cuts that there have been, and you will concede there have been significant cuts to Ministry of Justice budget, to the CPS, to frontline policing, uh, to activity in the courts, that those cuts have had not had any effect on the conviction rates. So first of all, let's get the numbers very straight. Since 2010, between 2010 and 2016, the MOJ budget, the spend, was reduced by roughly a quarter. That was us dealing with the aftermath of the economic crisis and the mess that the Labour Party made of it. From 2017 to current day, we increased the budget by 9%. But it's not just about money. So, for example, if you look at uh, one of the measures that we're taking to come through uh, the backlog, and in the civil law system, things like probate and divorce, we've had tremendous success in uh, driving efficiency and better service for those that use the justice system, is digitisation and technology. So yes, investment is important. It's increased by 9% in, in my department since 2017. But there are other things. It's the way we do things that matter as well. And I think that's true for the experience of whether it's witnesses, victims or the wider public of what they see and feel of the criminal justice system. But, but just to pick you up on the specific sentence construction you just used there, that it is not just to do with the money. I, I would agree with that. It just seems, though, uh, that Kit Malthouse yesterday, the Prime Minister yesterday, suggested that it's nothing to do with the cut in the budgets that we've seen at the MOJ. Well, we've had an increase in the budget by 9% since 2017. So I'm making the point that, of course, uh, it's important to invest in the right areas, but you've got to retain a responsible approach to the public finances altogether. And what I'm also saying, and I, I've got the advantage, as you said, Neil, coming back to the MOJ, um, I was courts minister in 2018. Let me give you three examples, GPS tagging, uh, uh, sobriety tags and virtual uh, giving of ev evidence or pre-recorded giving evidence for vulnerable victims. In those three areas, we've seen game-changing shifts in the way the courts and the justice system approach matters. And that is probably the most exciting, or one of the most exciting things and opportunities for me in terms of the next two years, because those things can not only drive efficiencies and uh, allow us to invest in different ways more effectively without just relying on extra uh, dollops of cash, but also will deliver for, as I said, vulnerable victims, witnesses and the average member of the citizen that has very little and uh, pretty rare contact with the justice system a much better service. Uh, just in terms, though, of the, of the Sarah Everard situation and the inquiry that, is, that has been set up, why has that not been put on a statutory footing? As it is, the inquiry, not on a statutory footing, cannot compel witnesses to attend, cannot compel witnesses to give testimony, given that one of the central accusations against the Met is that they close ranks when one of their own is targeted. Surely this needs to be put on a statutory footing? I think what people want is a, uh, us to get cracking on this uh, as soon as possible and to get to the truth, the, the inquiry works, that the Home Secretary... Though, 
it, it'll work. Um, and I think there, by the way, let's be clear, this needs to be looked at robustly, vigorously, without fear or favour. But I do also think that the police as a whole, uh, and the vast majority of, uh, of officers, are appalled by this and want to get those answers too. And therefore, but the inquiry how can you describe this as, as dealing with it robustly if we cannot compel people to give testimony? We're not going to have a problem uh, getting uh, to the truth of this because I'm telling you I think the vast majority of officers will want to proactively support this. But there are two elements yeah, to we're it. Talking, we're not, First the vast all, majority of could... officers will want to contribute, but of course you're not suggesting that the, the bad eggs in the Metropolitan Police are anything other than a small minority. It's the small minority we're talking about here. Absolutely, which is why the inquiry and the review that the Home Secretary announced will do, first of all, find out why and how Wayne Cousins could have risen through the ranks and uh, things like the flashing incidents and all the other, um, if you like, red flags that were going up, why they weren't taken more seriously. Secondly, it will look at uh, systemic issues, cultural issues uh, within the police. And I'm confident we will get to the bottom of this. And as Justice Secretary, we will have a, uh, we're already through the, uh, the, the review of uh, rape uh, cases and our violence against women and girls strategy, we're going to look root and branch at everything from, uh, I'm talking about the experiences mm -hmm. of female uh, victims, at everything from the time it takes uh, to examine a mobile phone in evidence, right the way through to, and we're already doing this, protecting vulnerable uh, victims, giving evidence in court, so you don't find that on top of the appalling ordeal, physical and mental trauma they've been through, that the justice system isn't compounding that with the way that they're treated. So we will look at everything from top to bottom uh, and I look uh, I've said it's uh, my number one priority to make sure women feel confidence in the justice system and confident in being able to walk the streets without having to look over their shoulder in fear. Let's talk about the, uh, the Prime Minister, uh, the man to whom you are, of course, in your new role as Deputy Prime Minister, number two. Uh, what are we to, to, to make of the, the emphasis this week on wage growth, on wage growth as being not the be-all and end-all, but certainly an overwhelming priority uh, for the Prime Minister? Are, are, is no one in government concerned that wage, wage growth goes hand-in-hand hand, uh, with an increase in inflation? Well, look, there's clearly, as we go through the pandemic, this issue of um, inflation. But uh, the forecasts show that uh, after the, this year, it comes back down. And, of course, the Bank of England has a mandate to target 2%. But the paradigm shift we're seeing in the economy, something that was much discussed during the Brexit referendum, but is part of, as we come through the pandemic, uh, the Prime Minister's overriding priorities, we've got a great record on bringing down unemployment, raising employment, the number of vacancies uh, being advertised for those who are coming off uh, benefits or who have been uh, furloughed is, is, is remarkable. Two million uh, more jobs than were expected. But we also need to make sure people can afford to, to live, uh, can afford to pay the bills. And uh, that's why with real wages rising, so over and above inflation on the latest quarterly figures, uh, six and a half, uh, sorry, six percent above inflation compared to the same time last year, with the national living wage uh, extended, uh, saving the average worker eligible £4,000 a year, it is critically important. And what we are also saying is we want, our vision is a high employment, high skilled, high wage economy, but not that is, rely that is going to take an awful long time to get to. That, that no, is going no, to take a considerable amount of time, but it's going to take no. some time to get to, and it's certainly going to take a lot longer than, for example, a decision the Prime Minister could, could make like that and not take £20 a week off of some of the poorest working families... £20 a week off some of the poorest working families in the country. I mean, the statistics on this are really weird. We've got Ian Duncan Smith on the programme later on, and he will rail against this. And the reason is 4.4 million households with 3.5 million children will see their incomes drop by more than £1,000, according to the Resolution Foundation. Why are we doing this? So first of all, we carried uh, and supported, the government supported, 40 million people uh, through furlough, through this pandemic. We extended universal credit. Um, that was always intended to be temporary. I've explained to you the national living wage. We've also uh, made sure that we, through uh, the extension of the personal allowance, say, personal allowance for income tax, saving uh, every worker £1,200 um, a year. But just specifically on UC, we also announced to get people off that risk of long-term unemployment and benefit reliance, including UC, a £2 billion kickstart 
package. Just one of the, uh, the £400 billion pound measures uh, that the Chancellor has introduced. So we are saying that, of course, the welfare system is there for the, those most in need. But what we want to do in this £2 billion pounds going into the Kickstart scheme, it's been extended, is supporting people off benefits into work. That must be right over the longer term. These aren't back of a fag packet calculations. I mean, the Legatum Institute says that the extra support has protected 840,000 people from poverty in the second quarter of this year, including, and again, I know it's a motive to mention, but 290,000 children. I mean, what is your message directly to those who will be moved into poverty as a result of the ending of the £20 a week uplift today? Well, of course, the, the emergency support we provided was because of the pandemic. As we come through the pandemic, with uh, youth unemployment going down, employment going up, we need to transition. We don't want to see people reliant on the welfare trap. We want to, where it's possible, and I know for not everyone, if someone's got a disability, that, that it'll be a different set of circumstances. There's targeted support there. But where it's possible, the right thing to do as we come through this pandemic, we've got uh, employment rising, vacancies at well, a record high. People on universal credit are either in work or looking for work, though, Mr. Rabb. I don't understand this uh, argument. And, and, and that's why, with wages through the national living wage, with the personal income tax, with uh, not relying on the cheap drug of, skilled, of unskilled labour from abroad, uh, our overall driving force of the economic plan is to see wages go up. And they have gone up. And, and I just cited to you the figures, um, the, the, the annualised figures for the latest quarter, that real wages over inflation have increased by 6%. We've got to start the OSS uh, relying... Says it's Overly and four percent in terms of uh, in terms of wage growth, no. which is pretty much in line with no. where inflation is. At the no, 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 no. I, I checked this morning before I came yep. on your As show the, the latest ONS explanation, and it says six percent. Uh, if you strip out bonuses uh, and those that get an uplift, it's four and a half percent. Those are the figures, the latest figures that the ONS uh, have provided. But look, the bottom line is the government wants uh, to inc in increase and promote the job creation that we've seen. That's relying on the entrepreneurs. We want to support the most vulnerable, but we've also got to transition people into higher paid uh, jobs. That is the sustainable long-term solution, and I don't see any other party with a credible alternative. Uh, Mr Rabb, we will be speaking again in the very near future, I'm sure. Good to see you this morning. Thanks for being with us. Thank you.